My name is Ayara Tucano. I am from the Tucano Nation, in the state of Amazonas in Brazil, in the border between Colombia, Brazil, and Venezuela. The climate crisis for us began at least 500 years ago, when, uh, with the invasion of our territories, that is so-called colonization, uh, most part of the actual forest that we had was cut off. And today, what is left of the Amazon forest is uh, the last resource that we have for survival. Uh, the Amazon forest has been attacked, it's been eaten by many industries, as the agribusiness industry and the large produ producers, uh, the mining exploitation, uh, and many kinds of traffic, as uh, the wooden traffic and animal traffic. Uh, all these industries and all this exploitation is coming with several violences towards our communities, uh, slave work, human traffic, alcoholism, depression, and suicide. Uh, and also with the criminalization of the indigenous leaders that are confronting the authorities and demanding the implementation of indigenous rights, the respect of democracy, and the protection of our territories. Uh, so it's not something uh, that is new, but it has always been urgent. And now more than ever, because our territories, the indigenous territories that are left in the world, protect more than 82% of biodiversity in the whole planet. Uh, there is no uh, climate justice or no biodiversity without cultural diversity that is represented by indigenous peoples with their knowledge, their practices, their sciences, and uh, how they preserve the, the life they are within. Okay, to talk about climate justice from a perspective from the global south or from the countries in the south, it's important to first try to look at the climate crisis and then the climate justice will be the response from the peoples to this climate crisis. So how do we see the climate crisis? It's generated by an econo economic model a production model, consumption and distribution model. That's the thing, that's what is behind this climate crisis. And um, we need to see that all the changes that we are seeing in the environment, in the climate, all these so-called um, environmental disasters are related to the human activity. So through the greenhouse emissions, we are generating these changes in the environment that's what we call the climate crisis and it's it's not only in terms of the emissions but in all the we are talking about all the changes that we are generating in the planet and that affects the territories and that affects the communities but then it has into the global system it has like a, a more bigger impact that we are seeing through this uh, environmental or climate extreme events like hurricanes and typhoons and those things that we are seeing more and more on news. So even when before people were denying that this climate crisis was happening, now we see that it is happening. And what we see is that the most affected people by those so-called extreme events are the people, the poorest people in the South. Um, and why is that? According to the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the countries in the South are more vulnerable because of their location, uh, but also because of the political and economic conditions to confront this situation. So it's not only a geographical thing, but the, the cause why they are more vulnerable is also related to the um, economic and political situation of those countries. Um, so then what should we do to solve that? And, and that's when the climate justice discussion com comes. 
because we say this all this destruction has been uh, caused by human activity but this human activity mm, relates to the production so how do we see this it's emission of greenhouse gases produced by fossil fuel uh, burning by industrial production by um, the agro industry production all those areas the transportation those are the sectors that we can relate to the causes of this climate uh, crisis or these emissions and who have been using them or why is this produces uh, this produced to fulfill the needs of the consumption in the north however where were those uh, fossil fuels where are those energy sources now in the south so the point here is that the extraction of the resources is happening in the south and it is affecting communities in the south the country where i come from colombia it has one of the biggest coal mines in the world uh, open pit coal mine and the communities around this, uh, this area where the mine is based, they have been displaced. The territory has been uh, destroyed, polluted. The water sources are disappearing or are dried or are polluted as well. People, um, they don't have anywhere else to go. And um, they are suffering now from diseases they don't have the possibility of uh, continue hunting or um, doing their traditional activities or growing. It's, it's just now the territory is not possible uh, to live in. And this is to uh, satisfy the energy needs from the north. That's why we say this is not just. This is, the, this is not an economic uh, just model. But this is causing at the same time the, the climate crisis. This extraction of fossil fuels is causing um, the climate crisis. Uh, so we have been seeing this for years. The scientists saw this 20 years or 30 years ago. And then uh, the UN created a body to address this climate crisis and to say, how can we now solve this crisis and it's called the uh, united nations from uh, framework convention on climate change unfccc so at this space for 20 years governments have been discussing what do we do to stop the crisis one of the things was this the noun kyoto protocol and the kyoto protocol was saying we need to cut carbon emissions um, in the coming years and come back to a previous level when it is not risky for the humanity. However, within this body, some countries, and, and this is when the, the problem becomes geopolitical, the northern countries, um, mainly pressed by the corporations, they started to see that these cutting emissions will mean to change the production model and it's not possible so they created uh, what we call false solutions to the crisis it's called in the in, in the language of the of the UNFCCC the flexibilization mechanism for this reduction of emissions and they are basically market mechanism uh, one of the main market mechanisms uh, relates to the European Union emission trading, trading system. And coming from there, the, it was proposed to have uh, the clean development mechanism. So what is that? that? All those technical things. What do we mean for that? And how is this impacting people? And how this relates to what we say climate injustice? Um, so, the northern countries have, according to the Kyoto Protocol, 
they have to reduce their emissions. They have like uh, allowances of emissions. And it became reality in the European Union to this uh, ETS, the European Union Emission Trading Systems. Uh, but they can exchange. So uh, if Germany uh, emits more and uh, Poland doesn't, then Poland can sell the extra uh, emissions permit to Germany. That's one option. That's the North-North option. The other option, and this is when the, the clean development mechanism comes in, is okay, you can uh, reduce your emissions in the South. And this is the, you can create a project that will produce another kind of energy and will reduce your emissions in the South, while you continue emitting in the North. So what is happening in the last years is that there is a lot of money to create those projects in the South. And let's see one example, one emblematic example of these CDM projects. It's the dams. Dams are presented as a clean energy uh, model. And uh, so what they do is they come, uh, and, and normally who are they? Corporations, again. So corporations come to the south and um, create a big dam, which will produce again enough energy, which at the same time is used to um, be exported or to extract uh, energy in those same countries or extract uh, uh, fossil fuels or raw materials. Anyway, so they come and they, they build these, these dams, but at the same time, they are displacing communities. They are uh, creating a big environmental damage in the regions where they are building these dams. And communities, again, don't have um, the space to continue living. So the impact is again the same is destroying territories, is destroying the relation with, between the community and the land, is destroying to, the possibility of having their own agriculture, um, while they say that they are just exchanging emissions. Plus, some studies show that the dams produce additional uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the outcome at the end is territorial destruction, destruction of communities, displacement. In many cases, since communities resist, then you see violence and you see criminalization and you see murders in some of those cases, unfortunately, me, uh, many of them. So we are seeing all this and we are not seeing any uh, reduction or any clear reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions. So at the end, what we see is this is not to solve the climate crisis. That's why we say this is false solution. This is addressing something else. And what is addressing is to produce new profits and benefits for those corporations. And at the same time, they don't have to reduce or change their actions in the north. So this, all of this is what is causing the climate injustice. That's what we say. But as I was saying before, the communities resist. Um, so the communities resist to these projects. The communities resist to the extraction uh, in, in their own territories. And why? Because they have a, a, a strong relationship with the land. That's why we are talking about territory. It means social and political relation with the land, with the uh, water and with the community itself. So that is another way to address the climate and environmental crisis, deepening this relation from the communities with the territory. And that's when we say, okay, this is our solution. This is the real solution to the climate crisis. Instead of deepening this other model that tries to keep the same consumption and production patterns, we say we need to change this.
to communities by resisting and keeping the, the, their space in the territory, their relationship in harmony with the territory. They are not only finding a space for themselves, but they are also offering a real solution. Uh, so movements in the south mainly, but in, in, in a dialogue with the, with the movements in, in the north, let's say a global movements, are proposing ideas like food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, um, buen vivir, coming from Latin America, from the Andean countries and from other regions, there are other ways to call the same idea of harmony between nature and, and human beings. But the point is, if we think uh, on, on a production model that don't need to improve more and more, when uh, the, the indigenous people say, we don't need welfare, we don't need more, we need to be good, to live good. That's what we say, buen vivir or suma causa in the own language. Um, and it means we don't need to consume more and more. We don't need to produce more and more. We have enough to live okay, to live good, live well. And that, that, is, that means a change in the mentality. And that is what comes to the real solution. But of course, this is a long way to that. So uh, using concepts, as, as we're saying, food sovereignty, which means each country uh, or each region and, or, uh, at the local level, we can produce what we need to eat. We don't need to import from uh, anywhere, but at the same time, we are strengthening our traditions in the way of producing and in the way of um, cooking. So it's traditional way of also developing our own way of eating. Food is a relationship itself. So food sovereignty in that way goes beyond uh, this idea of just having food for everyone or uh, feeding the world. It's also how can we strengthen at the local level and avoiding this transportation and all these uh, unequal relations uh, through the community. And then peasants movement say um, the agroecology cools the planet. So that's a real solution and there are Mm, numbers that prove that through agroecology you can provide food for everyone at local level and at the same time you are reducing emissions. So those community-based solutions are more and more providing a real solution for the, for the climate crisis. Of course uh, we need to keep resisting to the existing projects that's needed and in this way resisting is as well as uh, uh, a solution, resisting is a solution, uh, but at the same time through resisting communities are developing alternatives and that is one of the main points and what is one of the main things that people are doing in the south. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that's, that's one side. But to come up to what I was saying before, this needs a correlation with the political decisions. And that's when movements from the south and from the north come together to make some pressure to the government to demand real solutions. Stop developing all these solutions that affect people, that create more and more social and environmental conflicts and instead of that, start to really think on how to change this production model, this extraction model, and at the end, of course, the consumption model. So in this way, the, like the joint effort from North and South, from peoples in North and South, can address the climate justice. I am Dorothy Nalvega. I come from Uganda. 
I am uh, in the Green Party of Uganda, Ecological Party of Uganda. I am the representative for Africa on Global Greens Women's Network. This is because women are dependent on natural resources in the global south. We depend on natural resources to get our food, to get work. Most of the women are employed in agriculture sector. So with the long droughts, which are caused by climate change, we cannot get enough food to feed our families and we cannot get uh, crops for sale. Yeah, I'll give you an example uh, like poverty. Because like I said, we, we depend on agriculture because of the way we were raised up. We don't go to work. We sell our crops. So with the long droughts in Uganda, with the uh, landslides in Uganda, we cannot go to work. So we are really poor. And uh, that also uh, uh, retards our participation in, uh, in political uh, decision making. Yeah, this is because women are the most affected by climate change effects. So there is no reason as to why they should be left out when the decisions on climate change are being made. Secondly, women have the power to change situations. They are the ones who make decisions on what to eat. So if they are present on climate change decision making tables, they can learn more and they can go back home and decide well on what to do. Uh, uh, another reason is because women contribute almost 76% of, uh, of developmental work in my country, especially uh, on the farm products. So why should they be left out? Yes, we have some projects in Uganda. We have uh, like uh, joint energy and environmental projects. Uh, we teach women on how to make briquettes. Briquettes are an alternative for charcoal and biomass, which we mostly use in, a, in Uganda for cooking. So women have been taught how to make briquettes and they have also been trained on how to use energy saving stoves to reduce on the number of woods they use for cooking. And also, they have been trained on uh, using um, uh, modern irrigation systems uh, to cope with the climate change. Yes. Well, first to German, I demand that whenever there is a donation they are giving to our governments in the Global South, they should do it with, uh, uh, with a lot of demands, uh, like with conditions, to see whether these governments, uh, the projects they're funding are gender sensitive, and also to see whether the human rights commitments, like uh, the convention on uh, 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 discrimination against women is not only left on paper, Uganda ratified that convention, but these things are not implemented. So if they're giving donations, they should put that condition and see whether they're really implemented. And also other human rights uh, commitments. And at COP, I demand that we should re-emphasize the gender action plan of uh, COP23 in Bonn because even now, even after the gender action plan, most of the things we are not putting in, in consideration, we are still having more men at COP th than women. So I think we should re-emphasize removing it from paper to real action.
So we are now live on YouTube by Students for Future Germany. And uh, this evening, we have a special panel about climate justice. And um, we are now all together. Um, and we want the next two hours, we want to talk about climate justice, the different perspectives, uh, the different topics um, of climate justice. And so we have four guests from around the world, uh, which is, well, pretty unique and um, so important because we have to talk uh, to each other, and especially we in the Global North, we have to listen carefully. And I would love to introduce our guest today um, from the Philippines. We have um, Marinelle um, Ubaldo. She is a climate, a young climate activist. And after experienced uh, Typhoon Haiyan, she became active and an advocate for climate and the environment. She is an ecological justice campaign coordinator of Living, Living Ludato C in the Philippines and one of the founders of the Youth Leaders Environmental Action Federation. So welcome to our table. And well, from Uganda, we have Hilda Nakubuye. She is uh, the co-founder of Fridays for Future Uganda. And uh, she is an advocate for gender equality and diversity inside the climate justice movement. Then we have um, Tony Nafshin, an economist and also a degrowth expert and climate justice activist. She is currently, currently organizing a campaign to save the Sundarbans in the Bangladesh. And um, we have our guest is Peter Donatos, a journalist, human rights and environmental activist. And he's currently also the chairman of Payday Africa International and does organize a campaign against Shell. Um, and I would love to start with my first question. And this goes to Tony. Um, so system change, not climate change. That is a slogan used by the climate justice movement all the time. And because I know that you are an economic scientist and an expert on the field of degrowth, I would like to ask you if you could explain to us what is the meaning of the slogan and the concept of degrowth. Thank you, Catherine, for organizing this panel and inviting me here. Um, yeah, it's actually a very good question because oftentimes we think, uh, why does a climate movement gives this slogan of system change, not climate change? Because should we not just focus on reducing, like keeping our uh, temperature like 1.5 degrees below the pre-industrial level? Should we just not focus on some green solutions? And then why the movement is giving uh, this system change, not climate change slogan. So that it kind of goes back to the point or this uh, analysis that uh, we say that the main reason of the climate crisis we are facing today is this economic structure, the economic system that always prioritizes group, like certain groups profits over collective uh, benefits. And this, the point we are here has come to not just in one day or like 10, 10 years. This is a culmination for exploitation of different territories over several hundred years. So kind of if you look back and see that why um, we are facing this climate crisis, we would see that certain lifestyle that we have created and that is used as a model for everywhere else for the rest of the world is a very high consumption based economic model that goes to different territories different parts of the world, so different uh, continents, and kind of supports only a smaller part of the population could only leave through using that huge amount of um, material that are being extracted from different parts of the world. And when we look into that, then we kind of start realizing that this very high carbon emission based uh, economic lifestyle, this is not sustainable. We are 
already pushing our planetary boundary. And if we keep going through that path, I mean, we are already on a very terrible uh, path. If you look into that, we are already heading towards the tipping points. And after there are certain feedback loops start, we won't be able to stop the impacts of climate change. So for that, we, it's absolutely necessary that we as a whole human civilization reduce our, like the space that we're taking in this planet. And that would require, so from the degrowth movement, the idea is that because if because of the climate crisis, we would be facing big devastating economic impact. The way to avoid it is that we can plan and we can reduce the, the amount of material that we're using. We can reduce the space we take up in this planet and give space. So first of all, also to stop this way of living that is based on also on human exploitation, but as well as na exploiting nature in different territories. And that would mean then we systematically shift and move towards a path where we reduce this huge um, space that we're taking. And I, I was following a bit of the live streaming before, and there was one uh, video on Buen Vivir, and there were um, one of the activists, she was talking about how there are already solutions that exist. There, there are possible alternatives and we need to prioritize that like we need to start stop and start thinking what is the meaning of good life because we see at this point we have this huge amount of money like we are churning out our planet and we are creating huge and huge amount of money that we won't be able to spend in our lifetime but what do we need this money for so we need to stop and rethink that where our priorities should be what does it mean to have a good life and degrowth kind of puts all of those questions into the center and argues that, yeah, we need a much more reduced work hour. We need more circular economy. We need to rethink how we extract resources from nature and how we value uh, human nature relationship. So yeah, <laughs> sorry if I took uh, too long, but uh, I think I would stop here and I hope, yeah, I answered your question. So yeah, so coming back to kind of close that, and that's why for, for the climate movement, it's absolutely important to then start talking about system change, because we won't be able to solve this just by green cars or just by simply just introducing some um, carbon capture technology. So we the climate justice issue is a social justice and economic justice issue, and we have to start from there and kind of of go towards a bigger social transformation and system change. Thank you. Thank you. So my next question would go to Hilda, um, because we heard that it's important to change our economic system. And I would like to ask um, what's about changing our society and our culture. So is there anything else we have to change to stop the climate crisis? Hilda, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you so much for that question. And thank you for letting me be part of this panel and sharing my ideas, especially from the Global South perspective. I'm very honored to be here because uh, in most cases, people from the Global South are always underrepresented. And it's such a big honor to be here today. Uh, as per the question, uh, do we have to change our society and culture and our ecosystem, uh, economic system? And I believe that, um, yes, there is need to change our ecosystem. And I strongly agree with Tony because most of our leaders prioritize profit over people. And this is something that we should change. This economic system needs to be changed right from top to bottom, from the way we produce, to the way we sell, to the way we consume. And the way in which government distributes these resources is not equal, neither is it sustainable enough. Right now, we are at a level of action inefficiency. Our world and resources are at risk, more so our lives. We are all aware that developed countries are at, developed at the expense of our world. And I strongly believe that this is the time for developed countries to take on their moral duty of cleaning up the mess they require, they've created and stop making uh, developing countries a dumping ground. 
I believe that uh, they should be helping developing countries to overcome and fight the climate injustices and to fight climate change and the effects that we face every day, because this can, this can be implemented through, uh, first of all, implementing climate policies. Secondly, climate aid, for example, uh, during COP15, uh, developed countries agreed uh, about for a $1 million ba budget to be given to developing countries to help them in terms of climate aid. And that was set for 2020 and 2020 is here and these countries are not coming up. And then uh, also facilitating in sustainable development, this and among others. And as culture and social change, I believe that we can start by changing the way we behave and treat nature and biodiversity around us because uh, biodiversity loss is continuing and it's threatening the existence of, non of all living things and especially humans. We all depend on nature and we cannot live without it. We have the answer to biodiversity loss and therefore we should do that, and that is conservation. We should stop destroying nature in the name of development. Our production and consumption patterns plus the disregard for the environment have brought us to a tipping point, and we need to realize this should and act. Um, as culture, I will share, uh, there's some part of my country, Uganda, and in the North, there's, uh, there's a society that after marriage, they believe that after marriage for a couple to be completely independent, they have to cut down trees and then fence their home all, all around with cut trees. And with such cultures, I believe that they have to change. People have to know what uh, this, some of the activities we take on, how they affect our lives. And I believe that such cultures should change. When I was sharing with them about climate change, they had this negative attitude and then I had to explain better. But it's very hard to change our culture, but we have to change them for the better. The climate emergency is getting out of hand at a very high rate and we need to focus more and make it a priority. My culture looks at a girl child bearing the burden of the climate crisis, but I don't believe it because I believe that climate change affects us all disproportionately. We have to handle this all together, both genders. Women are always underrepresented at climate talks or negotiations, but this should change. We should see more women uh, on these tables because they can draw on their experiences to offer solutions to a changing climate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so my third question would be um, to you, Marine. Uh, we right now we heard that it's important also that women are sitting on the decision making tables and decision making structures. And so my question to you is because you are one of the founder of the Yacht Lead Leaders Environmental Action Federation, um, which pre sounds pretty cool and powerful to me. Um, so, but why is it necessary to have this organization and to get involved as a young person? And should we not trust the old generation in politics to know what's good for us? I think, um, why is it good that there is a youth-led organizations is because I agree with the other speakers that sometimes, you know, Young people are underrepresented in the decision-making processes, especially in the local and national level. And we want to make sure that our voice is being heard and that our leaders and politicians know what we want them to do, what, what our asks from them. So um, we have founded actually the Youth Leaders for Environmental Action Federation with the aim of mentoring um, little organizations or individuals from from all sorts of uh, um, background, so if they just want uh, um, to to start with their advocacy, where to start, how to start, and the people they can tap and starting their own advocacy, 
um, we mentor them on how they could focus on one advocacy to another. Because sometimes when we give talks to a lot of young people, uh, one of their main questions is really how to start, how to be an advocate or how to, have to be um, active in this kind of causes. And it, 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 it makes us feel it makes us happy because a lot of young people are actually now wants to really make a difference in their own ways um, for the betterment of our world. And, and that is the future that we want to see. That is the future that we want to see in this world where young people are leading, where young people are really involved in social issues and in, in, in giving solutions to social issues. That we're not just posting on Instagram, we're not just posting on Facebook or Twitter or ranting on Twitter, but also we're doing something in the grassroots. We're doing something in our own communities and we are solving, helping solving problems, not just our problem, but the society's problem. And it is just important for us that the voice of young people is being heard in the national level, especially in the decision-making processes especially if it involves our future and what is better for, for the youth. Because I think that adults, they have, you know, they have, the, they have the power to make um, decisions. But sometimes um, the youth, those people um, that they are, the, you know, the beneficiaries of their programs or projects are not being consulted on those kind of decisions. And just we thought that if you are deciding of what's better for us, you should go consult the young people because we know we know what could be the solution to, to the problem and we should be involved in the decision-making processes. So thank you so much. So my next question would be to Peter because um, when we have talked before the event, you spoke so highly about this new generation of climate justice activists. And I would like to ask which advice would you give the young person who just joined the movement? And especially uh, which advice would you give to handle the situation that uh, spaces for civil society are shrinking around the world? Okay, Catherine, thanks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the invite. And um, I'm very glad to uh, be part of these uh, discussions uh, this evening, especially when it has to do with young people. And for those of us who have been in this uh, struggle for decades, uh, we have a lot of stories to talk about. Um, there are one, one or two things I just want to slot in, and I think is uh, we're talking about climate change and system change, and uh, and I feel that um, um, somebody said, and I think it was Tony or so, that we have to uh, change the way our economic system or whatever. So and I I think the way we produce actually defines the way we consume. This is what I have the conviction because um, if we do not produce, we will not consume. So I will want to concentrate much more on the consumption. And uh, that uh, brings me to the point of uh, system change. I've been moving around with talking to people, stakeholders, and uh, and I know that especially when we hear such uh, terms like green capitalism, it stocks our mind as Africans, for instance, because we do not actually know what green capitalism means for us Africans. And that brings us to the fundamental question based on the fact that capitalism is based on the principle of how to maximize profit. How is it possible 
under a green capitalism to achieve a radical system change? This is a fundamental question which um, campaigners and political parties in the West are silent about and are not telling us what it means if we have to switch from one system to the other. Do we have to deliver more from Congo, from Nigeria, or let's talk about Congo, let's talk about batteries. And nobody's talking about that. Where are all these raw materials coming from to make this system or this, this, this system change effective or the, the change in, the, in our consumption or our production, it requires raw materials. Under which conditions are these, do we get these raw materials from Africa and other parts of the world? Therefore, I'm very glad to you, Catherine, that um, I have a feeling that you people are beginning to listen to us because all this why we've been like cropped out of the discussions, Africa and Africans, people of color, indigenous people. And these are the peoples that even hold, is the backbone of the Western economies. That's where the raw materials are coming from. And that's where we have the regions where they even feel more pains or effects of climate change. So it becomes very strange that Africans, people of color and indigenous people have been cropped out of the discussion, debates and policy making. So it's fed, when I'm talking to young people, we have to think about that. We have to also think about the fact that while we are searching for alternatives, these alternatives must never remain or should not again be on the cost of Africans and people of color and indigenous people. And this is where it's heading to now. And nobody is raising an alarm about that. And that is what is making me get sometimes nervous about that, especially to the Green parties who are my friends that we have not having any explanation from them as to what green capitalism means for this set of people. Now, the last point I want to talk about is why I'm so glad to see what uh, young people by the way, greetings to Africa, to Nigeria, to Cameroon, to Burkina Faso, to Ivory Coast, all over Africa, to the youths who go to the streets to demand their rights, to demand justice. So uh, my greetings to Africa. But let me say that no matter how many people will get to the streets, no matter how many treaties we sign on international levels until we start to think about criminalizing the destruction of the environment, we will not make any headway. So a change of strategy is needed. We need to criminalize acts that amount to ecocide because it's, 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 very, it's, very, it's very strange, you know, that you have uh, people can even get a license and get even supported by the various governments to go to other parts of the world to commit environmental crimes and remain unpunished. So we have to change the rhetoric. We have to change the debates. We have to change our strategies. And this is how we can move on. What we have been doing is good. I see young people every Friday on the street demanding 
continue doing that, but we need a change of strategy. We need to punish the CEOs who make uh, things like this happen, uh, not only in Africa, in Latin America, in, uh, in the Pacific, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so before I ask again my next question, I would like to ask Miriam if there are any questions from the chat online. No, I'm sorry. I don't have questions for you right now. Thank you. Um, so my next question would be to Tony again, um, because right now we heard about um, how important it is to think internationally. Um, and well, because I know that you have like experience in one, so many different levels and places with your activism. And because I know that you are also an observer at the UN Climate Conference, um, why was it for you important to be there? And besides, are they even necessary to reach climate justice? What do you think? Hmm. It's uh, funnily, I think at the same time, a very easy, but also a difficult question. Um, yeah, I think having, uh, like I was an activist in, in Bangladesh, back home, and, and um, from there my experience, but uh, within in Bangladesh, it was more in the framework of, we were fighting the World Bank's structural adjustment programs uh, that were being imposed on us and uh, about the the privatization of our education system and health system and kind of like it was a continuation I have to say like how my like life turned out like when we were I was I was in school um, high school uh, as part of that movement it was not exactly a climate movement back then but as, as a continuation we saw in, in 2012, when um, our government, start, uh, government started this project of, um, I will quickly then talk a bit about my, um, the, uh, the Shundervans campaign a bit. I'll take the chance to go back to, uh, yeah, uh, one of the campaigns that's very close to my heart. So when in 2012, uh, government of Bangladesh first started building this coal power plant near uh, the largest mangrove forest in the world, the Shundervans, and although it was very clear that this power plant will kill the forest, the government was still going ahead with it. And it was again, the same narrative that we need development and look at all the countries in the world, uh, Global North has developed, they have used coal, so why should not we? And from the movement side, we were saying that we need development, but this kind of development we don't want. It shouldn't be environment versus development and it is possible to have uh, different solutions so one of the most famous um, slogans of the movement was like there are alternatives to coal but there there is no alternative to uh, the Shundarbans and I think as a, like uh, when we were mobilizing with that so I think that was the first time kind of this element of environment started getting and also for me I was um, like I started to get involved more with the environmental issues. And um, then during during my master thesis, when I first encountered the IPCC reports, that's when I was absolutely convinced that the movement here in Global North needs to be much more stronger because somehow because of this whole global hierarchy, the communities who are the worst impacted, the, the frontline communities, the people who are the, we say, frontline defenders are the ones who are most um, affected by climate change. But at the same time, because this has been going on for a long time already, like uh, Peter has shared, like a few days ago, they, they uh, commemorated the 25 years of, of the Ogoni people's resistance against Shell. There were people who died, but now we are talking about it. But this has been going on for so long, right? But still, the change didn't come because of there are the, the power and the impact is so far away. And it, it takes, there are a lot of stages to really then come closer to the power or, or to the people who are responsible and may convince them that they need to change their act. And I think also even today that we are having this panel that we are organizing more, that we are listening to the voices of Global South, it, it, this has also come 
as a is a as already like I would say at least uh, uh, years of, of of people criticizing or talking again and again, and now we are seeing these kind of changes happening, right? So um, from from many of this per perspective, so in, in the in the COP when we were we were going to the COP, this was supposed to be that where we. Uh, the whole idea of COP has been like now it's it's uh, this year it was supposed to be uh, COP 26 right and and it this was supposed to be that at the COP when the people the most affected countries there are even different groups there are there are um, collectives of uh, the the most affected countries and there are island countries Bangladesh was even heading one of these uh, the the coalition who were supposed to for asking for reparation. But even though this has been going on for years, we haven't seen any substantial progresses. And only the last in 2015, the Paris climate, uh, the 1.5 degree was after a long time, long time of failed negotiation was something solid that we saw that that came into place. And even now with that 1.5 degrees, we see how much we are needing to mobilize. We are still needing to demand um, government. So in, in from, from my, like uh, where I'm coming at is that like, so now from my experience of having uh, being active in all these different uh, levels and spaces and also then being at the COP, what I felt was somehow it was still not enough. It was we we need to be in the streets in our all our national at national level, local level, but also international level. We need to be holding our governments accountable in all the other places like they must not be able to maybe sleep or turn without being afraid that okay every time I go somewhere there will be some climate activist demanding me and holding me accountable of my actions otherwise we really I don't think it's, it's going to be only through this closed door or even this limited access where all the civil society couldn't even go to the cop no so I think it's it's useful to certain extent. It's useful as an event. It's useful for for like an iconic. It has an iconic value, but at the same time, we see how even the demands of reparation often doesn't take as much importance as uh, other kinds of negotiations the governments ends up doing. So I think for people power to be mobilizing, we need to be mobilizing on the streets way more. We need to be organizing this kind of talks. We need to be connecting the the fights from all different parts of the world together and kind of keep pushing the governments like everywhere they go. I think that's where we have to be heading and not just, um, yeah, kind of be happy. Or I mean, I think most of us, we already know that actually also that, that COP is not enough, but it's like, of course it has some value, but we have to be doing way more. I hope it answered your question. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. And um, my next question would go to Hilda again. Um, because I know that you visited also the UN Climate Conference, the last COP in Madrid. And so my question to you would be, which experience did you have and what would be your demands in terms of climate justice regarding the next COP, uh, especially addressed to the countries of the global north? Thank you so much, Catherine, for that question. Well, yeah, last year I had, um, I attended my first COP and that was COP25 in, in Madrid. And to my brain, I was very happy to be there because this was the first uh, COP I was attending and I knew that this is the biggest conference where uh, it's the biggest climate change conference that I could ever attend and I had all my hopes up. But not only was it a COP that committed the year of action, but it is also a COP that failed us. Uh, after 25 years of negotiations and talks mm -hmm. and talks, it still failed us. And I got a question today from a conference where I was talking and someone asked me if you are talking about climate change and it seems to be a priority then why don't we have more COPs or conferences of parties more often just like we see the G20, G8 meetings and what I told them is that it is not about how many conferences we have a year but it's actually about how much actions we take as countries, as individuals, as organizations. It's not the talks that matter, but it's the actions that we people take on that really matter. 
it doesn't make sense if we attend five cops a year when we literally have no action done, like no talk, no actions, just talks. And this COP, COP26, that had to be this year in Glasgow, but was pushed to next year, I was aiming at something new because at least I had an idea of what COP looks like or what happens there. And I was more hopeful this year that maybe there would be change. And since we've been hearing a lot of talk about gender equality, uh, gender balance in COP26, I was very hopeful to see that. And I hoped that maybe women would be uh, more in the negotiations and also more well represented in the tables. And my demands for COP26 would be, uh, first of all, climate justice. And in this, uh, I would request that um, not only countries in the, not only developed countries to be, to be given, uh, what should I say, like mob attention or, um, okay, uh, climate justice in the way that our leaders, uh, the world leaders make decisive choices and also decisions and commit to take on climate action as a daily practice and not only a practice when there is need to, but also a practice that is done each and every day, because we are talking about an emergency. It's not something that is coming in the future. It is something that is already happening and therefore should be given priority. And uh, also climate justice includes implementing the present policies, the policies that have been agreed to or ratified. For example, my country, Uganda, ratified the Paris Agreement in 2015, but then this agreement has so many goals, but implementation is a very big problem, not only for my country, but also for many other countries that signed this agreement. And therefore, I would demand for more concrete actions from countries that ratified this agreement. And I would demand that we should solve the, this global crisis, uh, climate change as a global community because it does not discriminate when it is affecting us. So I would demand that countries globally come together and resolve this crisis as a global community. And I would also demand for biodiversity protection and conservation because I strongly believe that our lives depend on nature, our health and everything we do depend on nature. Without nature, we cannot survive. And I would also demand that developed countries take on the responsibility of their actions and be accountable for them. They should stop making developing countries a dumping ground. They should also treat us like the human beings we are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Miriam wrote that there are no questions in chat. And so I would like to ask Miriam to ask the next question from the audience. All right, our audience has woken up yet. So I have several questions now. And maybe because Marinelle is still with us, I ask you the first question. And it comes from Kiel, so the very north of Germany. And it says, couldn't we found partnerships between regional climate activist group for exchange of knowledge and experiences and to plan climate action together? For example, the group in Kiel with Manila. Is it, the question is, is if it's possible? Yes, and if you would like, like it or it would help you or not? 
Yeah, actually, we have been doing that. Um, like here in the Philippines, there are a lot of branches for like Fridays for Future and other organizations. And what we do basically is um, as we are envisioning on the same goal, we have the same aim, we have the same vision, and that is to protect the environment, to, um, to, to hold those accountable, those people who are accountable. Um, to to demand the accountability from them, we always like uh, try to um and like brainstorm how we could partner in the future and what could be their um what could be their projects and what could be our project that could be um that could be uh, fused in the future project and how we could support each other. So basically, um here in the Philippines we are just a small community of climate activists and that so we're already got, we're already scattered around the country and we want all we always want to support each other's advocacy because um we are just aiming for the same goal and we're just aiming for the same uh, for the same uh, we are just demanding for the same accountability and uh, yes we're already doing like a lot of talks and interchanging of ideas with a lot of um, Fridays for Future groups in different parts of the world, like in Japan, in in Europe, and in other parts of the world, how we could how they could support us in our advocacy here in the Philippines, and how we could also like partner with them in their advocacies in um in 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 their own countries. Because I really believe that we can you know um adapt and replicate other other initiatives that the youth organizations have already doing in their own countries because that could be um, that uh, that could be a useful um, tool already in in their own in in formulating more projects for their for the social issues in their country country sorry thank you so i now got another question it's a concrete uh, question to peter so I would ask you the question, Peter, and it is about, they are asking, so the community asks, how dangerous is it for you to be climate activist in your country and to fight against Shell? This is the first one, I have a second one for you later. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, Nigeria is also, uh, we have the same problem in uh, Latin America and I mean in all countries where uh, we have uh, uh, big uh, strategy, uh, um, uh, big uh, 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 companies uh, doing business, businesses there. In the case of Nigeria, um, it's uh, still very dangerous to uh, be, a, be an activist, generally an activist not only um, environmental activists. And um, way back in the 90s, when we were pushed out of the country because of this, and make me from my youth days to now to leave my parents and be outside of the country. And um, it's, uh, we have democracy in Nigeria now, which makes it a little bit difficult, more difficult to explain. In the time in the 90s, it was a military dictatorship, and now we have uh, a kind of, uh, democracy existed there. So what we have there now is not people being uh, of, often arrested for their activism directly, but uh, indirectly, indirect uh, persecution, extrajudicial uh, murder and uh, kidnapping and all that that is happening in my country. So it's extremely dangerous to, to do this kind of business, human business in Nigeria. And uh, but the people are very determined, you know, because uh, they don't they actually have more, more to lose. If you follow the events in the last weeks in Nigeria, you will, you, 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 will, you will discover a determined generation. You, determine, you will discover a determined generation, a generation that is so determined for change. And this is not only in Nigeria, all over the world. The youths are standing up and they are speaking and they have spoken, and it is now time for us who are a little bit older and the older ones to pick it up and not only listen, but act. 
act now before it's too late. Act because if we don't change the source, the way we manage our energy production, we will never we will never have it done with because we're talking about climate justice. There's something that led to that climate, that term, that terminology, climate justice, and we are not talking about it. And that is environmental racism. And um, so if we uh, want to make a change, we have to really tackle this sector of uh, energy production. And um, I think, uh, I don't want to take much of your time, but I hope I have answered that part of your question before I went Talking of course you have, and okay. I may have a following question because it's more general, but uh, concerning like the structural economic changes. So which structural economic changes in the global north are needed to overcome this global injustice you just talked about? Have you got like two, three points to make it? I, I mean, it's a big problem and to sum it up, this, this meeting is not yeah. enough, but mm -hmm. maybe yeah. this is what the community asks. Yeah, it's 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 it's, uh, it's we are in a dilemma, and uh, you see, when five more than five, the history of environmental justice, at least in the African perspective, uh, can be traced back to well over five hundred years ago, and nothing has actually changed, and it has become even worse. So and. Um, if we uh, think that, um, you know, I've been very, very provocative. And because we want some radical changes. And we have sometimes need to be radical in our words, in our definitions, without offending or being violent towards another. I liked it when the uh, creator said, how dare you, you understand? So, and, um, so how dare we think that a system which all of us here in Europe all agreed that this system is practically, I mean, if we want to follow this system, we are heading for a doom, which means this system is no more uh, healthy for the human. So, and at the same time, we are importing, exporting these systems to Africa, not only political and economic, but technological uh, 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 transfer, whereby, um, technologies that are totally banned in Europe because of this pressure from the, uh, from, from the grassroots for change. Even these companies get export subsidy from the German government, from the European uh, governments to export these technologies and dump them in Africa and, um, and, um, 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 global, so-called global south. And so I, I asked myself, how dare you think that we will believe that you are really serious about change, about radical change, because that is what we need, radical change, to be able to at least try to save the planet. You know? And the last point is, now that's what I always say during my lectures. How is it possible under this regime, under this regime of capitalism, to achieve that which we have been saying now, talking about a radical change? Because the principle of capital capitalism is based on the maximization of, uh, of, uh, of profits. And so how is it then possible you see, it, it makes it for us who are campaigners from, from Africa, we, we, we speak to you, but we, we just feel how is it then possible for them, for us to allow us to breathe?
because you can no longer breathe. 500 years, more than 500 years. And there seems not to be an end. So how is it possible for them to wanting us to believe them that they really take us serious, even when they don't even listen to us? And we see things happening in Europe. And we know very well that the, the system here, the social system, the wealth is not coming from Europe. It's coming from somewhere else, from Africa, from other parts of the world. And these are the people that bear the most, um, the, the avert effects of climate change. They get nothing for their raw materials. Their, li their means of li livelihoods have been destroyed. Their children are forced to, to, to take uh, risky uh, routes through the deserts and, and the seas, to die in the seas in tens of thousands of folds to, to get to Europe and to be called economic refugees. You know, this, are this, this is, a, is a compact project or concept, you know? It's, 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 it's everything in there. So when we're talking about energy, when we're talking about climate, we're talking about justice, everything is just built in there. And it's all about racism. So let's not forget that part. If we want to fight this system, we have to fight racism. Because it was racism that made it possible that the white Europeans all over the world enslaved people, enslaved Africa, destroyed the environment today, and nobody gets punished for it. Let us say, forget about 500 years ago. Let us talk about today. How is it possible that a CEO, a CEO is is destroying the environment and means of livelihood in Congo, in Nigeria, and other places in the world. But they even get subsidy to do that, not even get punished. So we should start talking about that. If we, young people, please, we should start talking about that. You should start make, putting pressure on your governments. You go sign treaties. But these treaties, you have to put it into your national laws. And that's what you should be fighting for on the, uh, in, at the different national levels. Your Friday for Future, it's good to explain to the people what the effect of climate change, but it's now time to get radical. I mean, radical in the sense of not, uh, <laughs> Catherine knows what I mean by being radical. She has, she has experiences about that because people always understand, misunderstand that term being radical. What I mean by that, we need to be forceful with our demands. Thank you. Thank you very much. I ask Katrin now if I continue with two more questions, one for Tony and one for Hilda, or if I leave her the choice of the next questions. And now please continue with your two questions and then I will go, go back to my questions. All right. So before I will do this, uh, we got one question which I think we can ask you all for to answer, but at the end of this discussion. Um, so you have some time to think about it. Uh, it's more about it came from the chat and they asked us, how do you keep up hope and motivation in the fight against climate change and for climate justice, despite so many frustrations and seeing no fundamental changes happening? So I think it's a nice question in the end. So think about it. And now I continue with the question to Tony. And we got a question that asks, where can I as an individual from a global north country start when I would like to do more for climate justice on a global scale? Um, I think first thing would be to getting to know more, like learning the struggles, like what's happening really. I think it would sound a bit nerdish, but I think starting the IPCC reports 
is really a good start in a way because it kind of really centers you. You you kind of get an idea of what we're dealing with and at the same time it really makes the urgency clear and the, the fact that it is a it's a it's a scientific report it's like the best scientist the best scientist in the in the who are dealing with all these different areas of nature right all these different parts of climate they come together as a panel and they provide all of them come up work this is a very rigorous work and then if you encounter that i think that kind of really shakes you and stays with you and from that point, I think then you can never go back. So once you read the reports, you would really see what it would mean on a global scale and what impacts it would have on different uh, communities in, in a global south. And then it could never be any more about for the love of skiing or like we had this, um, I will quickly just take this chance to talk about this uh, climate, the BIPOC climate justice conference that we organized just um, last week, like for uh, not last week, uh, 14th, 15th of November. And there in one of our panel, this was the discussion at how there are these differences uh, between uh, the people who are fighting for climate, but then there are people who are fighting for the love of skiing. And then there are people who are fighting because there are songs that will never be sang. There are communities who, who, who would not be uh, there anymore, who, who are the whole house, like the, my, my uh, homeland, like Bangladesh, by 2071, there wouldn't be any country called Bangladesh because of the sea level rise. So when you know that, I think you can never stay stuck in a privileged bubble, then you would never, um, you, you would have an understanding of how unjust this crisis is. And I think that is always a good start from a very clear understanding of how unjust the crisis is because the, the responsibility of the crisis and the impact of the crisis is so uh, varied. And then when you see that, that how even today the discussions and the people who are talking about climate, they, they still stay in a privileged bubble, it would create a lot of emotions in you. And I think that is always a good start. Like it's always a good start to start with emotions, start with fact and truth that makes makes a makes your own personal truth and emotion and i think when you start from there it's very difficult to be derailed then you would find your way i think that's what i would say thank you to you too uh now my last question for now uh, is to hilda so it is like asking for the current situation because a question says how is the situation with the pandemic affecting your protests right now? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Well, the pandemic really affected our climate strikes because we keep on striking every Friday, but right now we cannot. We can only do that online because it's very risky to strike on the streets like we used to. And very recently in September on the global climate strike day, 25th, we were arrested by police because of carrying out our global strike and it was cut short because of these uh, ongoing um, talks and also most probably because our country is undergoing through election. So we are having political campaigns and Due to many people's misconception of climate activism, many people think that we are a political movement and we just have like political ideologies. So that's why there's so much collision and so much misunderstanding about who we really are and what we are trying to portray out. So that's why we are arrested by police and Right now, it's very, very bad. We are having diverse effects of climate change. Recently, we are facing constant floods and our, starting from April this year, we had uh, Lake Victoria water levels rising above normal, above the normal level. And this ended up flooding very many communities, especially lake communities and people who stay around there. Uh, many people lost their lives. About 200,000 people were displaced, making them climate refugees in their own country. 
and we have to deal with this same problem over and over again. And among other things, but basically that is the situation. Each and every time people are uh, chased out of their uh, their ancestral places due to floods. Yeah, it's very bad. So we just have to keep on the online strikes in order to stay safe and also protect other people we care about. Thank you. Um, so I would like to continue with my questions and um, I to our guests, if you want to, um, if there's um, a question you also want to answer, then of course you can answer as well, or if you want to add something. Um, and well, my next question would be again to Mariner, um, because we just heard from Hilda about the effects of the climate crisis in Uganda. And now, um, while in Germany, we are just starting to notice a little bit the effects of the climate crisis, like we can feel our summer are getting hotter, and our forest ecosystem, this is one example, they are under stress because of the drought. But still, for many, the climate crisis in Germany is something really far away or somewhere, somewhere in the future. And um, could I ask you how the Philippines getting hit by the effects of the climate crisis right now? And um, is the question of how we are dealing with the effects of the climate crisis globally also a question of climate justice um, when we look to the capital of loss and damage and also the question of migration. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, the Philippines is in the front line of every other disaster. Um, if young people here didn't know that in 2013, um, the strongest typhoon ever recorded in human history hit the Philippines. And it is a, it devastated a lot, like millions of livelihood, um, thousands of people have been killed, cities have been devastated. And then last two, two weeks ago, um, the strongest typhoon for 2020 landed in the Philippines too. And there were like three typhoons who came together just one day after another. So I can say that um, the Philippines is already dealing with the brand of climate change in our day-to-day -day basis. Especially in the Philippines, we're an archipelago. A lot of people are actually really relying on the environment and the sea and the, what the nature could give them. So a lot of people have this intimate relationship with the, with the um, environment. Yet a lot of people also don't know what could be the 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 drive what drives the change in the environment. And I I myself as a as a survivor of Super Typhoon Haiyan I don't uh, I can't accept that, that Super Typhoons uh, that disasters could be our way of life that migrating to other places that fleeing could be our our um, way of life because even just uh, you know going to evacuation center whenever there is a typhoon is already very um, challenging because you have to beg people to um, accept you in their home so that you could be safe during the storm and that boils down that all boils down to why is Philippines and other vulnerable communities are suffering that much, even though if we are not contributing more of the, of the world's emission, carbon emission. For me, just what we, um, the climate justice liability petition that we have submitted to the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines is just very timely. We have submitted that in 2015 because we wanted the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines to investigate 47 carbon majors in the world. Well, there are 90 plus of them of carbon majors. When I say carbon majors, they are, they are the, high, the highest emitting companies who are fueling climate change. And in 
in, for the seven of them exist here in the Philippines. So we want the Commission on Human Rights to see their human rights violations linked to climate impacts. For me, that was uh, the, the win of that petition because that was the landmark petition. It was the first in the world petition. For me, that was the first step towards climate justice because we are we should not stop there. We should not stop telling them that you are legally liable, that there is already a legal paper that's saying that you are legally liable for fueling climate change, for all the human rights violations linked to climate impact. After that legal document, we have to make a move how to sue them, how to sue these people, because that is the way to the to climate justice. These people in the vulnerable countries should not suffer more. And this carbon emitting, highest carbon emitting company should not profit from the suffering of other people. I am so tired of fleeing. I am so tired of, of always uh, um, evacuating my family. I'm so tired of just being, you know, hopeless whenever there is a typhoon. I am so tired of not having anything, going back to zero whenever there is a typhoon because we could not do anything. And a lot of, a lot, and this, uh, and this, highest carbon emitting companies are actually profiting from the suffering of other people, not just in the Philippines, but in other countries like in Africa and Nigeria and other countries. And maybe it is true that um, the effects of climate change is not really um, felt, it is not directly felt by people in the, West, in, in the global north. However, I truly believe that climate change has been already happening in the other side of our, because it could it could affect us in other in every aspect of our lives because we are all just connected. I mean, this virus could be um, could root it could root from from the change in our climate, from the global warming, you know. And if we will not go forward to better normal, if we will just go back to what it was normal, we will be experiencing more plague. We will be experiencing more changes, and that is not good. We should not go back to normal. We should build a better normal that is considerate of our environment, that is considerate of what people might maybe feel or what might people might be maybe suffer suffering in the other side of the world. So if you are just if you are just doing something for your, I mean if you are doing something for your country, think of it like a global action because actually what you're doing now is not just for your country but for for the countries vulnerable countries in the other side of the world because whatever you do in the first world countries it affects us and even though we don't know what we, what is going on even if we don't have any like contribution to it we are still suffering from it and that is just so unfair and i want you guys in the global north to change that way so that we in the global south could not you know could not just feel the brunt of something that we don't even cause Sorry for the long, but I hope I have answered the question. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing. And um, so my, my follow up question would be also directly because, uh, well, in Germany, we also right now have um, a dis discussion about EcoSeed and how we can um, hold accountable the like the, the huge companies were destroying um, well our environment globally. And so I don't know how, uh, who would like to answer, um, but what do you think about this discussion? Like Becky, Peter, I think. And um, because I also know that you are part of the, of the, the campaign in, in Germany. Um, so I think this is also like, a, really important step forward. How can we sue the companies um, who are doing this huge destruction in our world? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sister Hilda from uh, Uganda uh, was asked about um, um, the coronavirus pandemic. Please allow me to say that uh, from my perspective, that Africa actually does not have a, a problem with coronavirus per se, but 
um, a hunger virus. That is what is uh, actually biting hard in most countries in Africa. And that is also aggravated by the coronavirus itself too. And um, I think that I want to uh, uh, commend the, uh, uh, my, uh, the speakers who have been making a lot of uh, beautiful statements um, about um, um, the way to make a change. And I think we should not uh, relent in our efforts to continue to fight because uh, I can explain, I can tell you a lot from my experiences because I think that they cannot sleep while we are still awake. I don't believe that they should sleep while we are still awake because we are living with the problems and they are profiting from that. And um, it's not about dividing peoples. Of course, we've been divided. We need to bring the peoples together. But we have to know where, where we are. Then in Germany, in Europe, there's been a lot of campaign um, to criminalize ecocide. And um, we have uh, campaigners like uh, the, the Pope, uh, even Macron, and we have some some other uh, initiatives from Belgium going on right now. And uh, I think uh, Greta even donated $100,000 uh, to support, uh, I mean, she got a prize and she donated that to support the fight, I mean, the cause of uh, criminalizing ecocide. So it's, it's become a very huge topic here in Europe, also especially in Germany. And let me just say that this is not just that the Germans just picked up this topic. It is as a result of people like me, like you. I mean, uh, Catherine can also confirm that, who go around the whole of the place to sensitize the people and the, uh, the people sitting on the politi with, with, with political powers about this topic ecocide. So let me just make it clear. Right? The blacks, people of colors, and the indigenous people who are living here or who come in here sometimes, who actually made it possible that we have gotten to that stage of Germany, taking it seriously to at least debate on it. Because we have the we have uh, the ICA codes, which been existing since 1990, and uh, almost all the countries in the world signed that treaty. But only a few countries ratified it, and countries like Russia, Belarus, countries that I can't even pronounce their names. Sorry. Excuse my French. You don't hear countries from the from rich Western Europe or America. In fact, Germany actually was part of those countries that blocked that phrase in that draft, which makes it possible, which doesn't make it possible to now to criminalize ecocide at, at peace time only at war time. This is, this is so crazy. This is so something which you can't even explain to, to youths. How is it possible that at peace time, ecocide is legal, at war times, it is illegal. So, and I think that the movement is really getting big and bigger and uh, there are a lot of campaigns going on right now, petitions. I have uh, one running right now uh, together with Payday International with about 20,000 uh, people already signing. Please, you can continue to sign this petition. We must continue to put pressure on the government. Why? Because I, I personally ran a campaign 
against Shell. And I'm still running the campaign, but in the 90s, it was a boycott campaign against Shell. It was successful, but it was just for a certain, for a period of time. You gather the momentum, the cameras are gone, the topic is dead. So now you can't even hold these companies responsible. When you tell people don't buy share product, they will say, okay, if I go to Total, is it better? If I go to Chevron, is it better? So it's not a matter of consumption. We cannot change this by uh, thinking that the multinational companies whose sole aim is to maximize profit, that they will come to their senses to, to come up with a change of policy, that the same standards operating in their own countries are also being uh, put to use in other countries of the world, where the, for instance, the raw materials or whatever are coming from. So what we need is like political parties like the Green Party forming a, uh, a coalition, a broad coalition with other like-minded parties from, especially from the left side to enact a law that will forbid, that will prohibit any multinational company that has its roots from Germany to carry out environmental crimes, be them here, be these crimes here in Germany or outside Germany. We need this law. We need this law to be able to move forward. If not, we'll be in, we'll just be going to the streets and protesting and protesting, doing our petitions, and they will even give us money to do that. You know, they will even give us money to do that. You know, so and um and generations, and we continue to transfer this tra traumatic experience to other generations th that yet to come. So when are we going to see an end? So we are asking for an end. And the only way we can ask for an end, and we can get this end, is to have a functionable law on the in if we don't have to, we can't wait for this international consensus. It will not come. They will, they will always find a reason and they hide behind this lack of consensus to say, ah, oh, okay, we are in Germany. We can, uh, Germans will always say, ah, we can't do this, align and shuffle. We cannot do it alone. You know, that's always what you always hear. But they signed this contract, this treaty together. They signed it together. So why can't, so it's, if it's not possible to, to, to put this into practical terms together, then let us start doing it or uh, doing it nationally. Let's not wait for the other. So that should be the tenor of our struggle to confront the national governments, to enact laws, to punish CEOs for committing economic crimes in this part of the world on destroying the environment that will also lead to climate uh, problems. So uh, I hope I'm not taking too much time, but I think it is very, very important for this evening when we're talking about climate justice, we must talk about sanctions. We must talk about sanctions because we, 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 we can't we can breathe anymore. I personally have gone through, I mean, I, Two weeks ago, I said it in one of my lectures. I said it is very difficult. It's very rare to find we have them, but very few people whose biography is just determined by the struggle. The struggle is the biography. The biography is the struggle. But I want to live a different life. People want to live a different life. Like Marina said, you know, people want to be to have social security. They want to be secured. They have a right to that. Everyone has the right to stay in his or her own home without migrating. Because this is the place that is familiar to this person. So stop destroying the homes. 
of these people. Just like as I'm so proud of Catherine when I started seeing him on TV uh, with his actions there uh, with, uh, I think, uh, Hambacher Wild and, and this uh, LWE arms. I was so proud of her and so on. This is about what they call Heimat. So how dare you people think that I don't have the right to also have a home? How dare you people think about that? Thank you. Thank you so much for your clear words. And um, I would like now to ask Tony also a follow-up question because right now we are um, talking about what can we do in Germany? What can our government do? And how are companies behaving, also German companies behaving around the world? And because I know you have the campaign against the Sundarbans, uh, not, not against the Sundarbans, uh, against the coal power plant next to the Sundarbans. Um, and I would like to ask you to share with us your experience and how, um, how it does matter uh, what we are doing in Germany. Yeah, and what also what can we do to support your campaign? Um, yeah, like uh, what we see more and more with the coal and the fossil fuel industry, oftentimes the companies that are benefiting from this business are based in global north. For the case of Schunderbans, although the main financiers and the project is being taken by the Indian government and Bangladesh government jointly, uh, there are like uh, uh, Bangla the German company Fischner is involved as providing a engineering and consultancy support for this um, power plant. And when we were researching into Fischner, what we saw that Fischner is also involved and they have um, developed, like they claim on their website that they are, they have specialized in coal in the past. They have uh, several coal plants in Germany um, that they're operating and maintaining their building some also in different parts uh, in Africa in Afghanistan. So, and then, then because I also work uh, with Urgewald, um, this um, uh, NGO, where we look into the finance part, the finances, heal, like kind of address the root of the climate crisis. So mainly it's um, the, uh, the few fossil fuel companies that are really uh, driving it. But then when we look who, who are the money and the investors who are giving money into these companies, there we also see there are several um, German so there are, of course, a, a lot of other international companies and, and banks that are supporting fossil fuel businesses, but uh, definitely like uh, today as part of my research, I was just looking into all these German uh, financing uh, companies and uh, investors, creditors who are, uh, who, are um, uh, who have projects, who are financing in different fossil fuel projects in different parts of the world. They're Um, they claim to you. be a very sustainable company. They... Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you again, but I don't know if it was my connection or your connection. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. What we see from uh, the example of Fishnar is that even the companies that claim to be very um, uh, sustainable, very good, they are benefiting from dirty business in different parts of the world that are um, driving the climate change. And I think with this project, what we try to show more is that often how these companies are hiding. They they are involved in a lot of uh, businesses that are that are uh, harmful for, um, uh, 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 for for the environment, for the climate uh, crisis that we're facing today. But at the same time, they do a lot of greenwashing in their own hometown. They claim to be sustainable in their own um, uh, country. They could even be working with the with the federal governments or different parts of uh, uh, like helping uh, taking up projects that the government ministries are, are suggesting. 
So this was uh, like what we wanted to emphasize as well, like we need to then kind of again clarifying the responsibility so it's not only just um, that the governments are not taking enough steps but it's also the businesses who claims to be um, green they are also involved in different kind of uh, projects so and this is what happens always like I and mean, this is what we hide with this like global higher, like relationships economic business relationship it gets so difficult to really track who's doing wh what and and all the Accountable. Um, we often don't. We are not able to directly link the responsibility, like the response, like the impact, with the people who are responsible. So, with the Fishner campaign, when we organize this um, a mobilization in front of Fishner's office, what it was also kind of a satis satisfying for us as well, because we could tell that they never, they never dreamed that for a project far away in Bangladesh, they would have people in their own town. Uh, all the, this Fridays for Future kids and all this all these people of their own hometown coming to their office and demanding like why are you doing this project why are you destroying a mangrove so far away so that was also what we see this is i think also a kind of like a positive um outcome also as well like now that we get i think this is also an example of when we get aware of struggles of different parts of the world we see how we are really connected like the connections they they often are hidden but once we learn and then once we really dig in we see how these are really super connected and this is where also the strengths could be that these companies they did never expect it and they think oh what happens far away in bangladesh it doesn't matter it doesn't affect us here but when in their own town they they get questions now they get um they have to answer to their own citizens that oh and, and also that the employees and their employees kids are asking their parents like oh you work so we thought it's a very proud job but it's not so much that has a lot we could use this kind of social power as well to force and kind of strengthen um a campaigns um yeah a campaign thank you so much for sharing um and my next question was also like a follow-up to hilda because well like um Tony explained to us how she's trying to save the Sundarbans and also me in my home region, I'm trying to save a forest. And I know that you are in Uganda also really active to try to save an old forest as well. And I would like to ask if you want to share um, why this forest is under threat and what your group is doing to protect it. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that question. Well, um, in Uganda, Friday is for Future Uganda is trying uh, very much to reach out and share with other people so that we can join our voices under the global, global youth-led campaign to save Bukoma Forest. Uh, Bukoma Forest is a forest in Uganda and it's uh, the largest remaining block of natural forests along uh, the Alberta and Rift Valley. And this forest covers uh, 401 square kilometers with over 34 species of mammal, 225 species of bird, and about 260 species of tree. It also has about 500 chimpanzees, but Every time this, the number of these chimpanzees reduce because people are killing them and they also keep migrating to other parts like Congo. And among other primates, also this same forest has a population of Ugandan magembas that are only endemic to this forest. That means they can only be found in this particular forest. And recently, our uh, Uganda's forest cover has dropped up to 8%. That means we have lost about 92% in the last uh, 15 years, and that is a very big percentage to go with. So this forest to us and to the whole world, it is worth saving. We cannot risk to give away this forest. The threats that are going on is that um, Bogoma Forest uh, is facing certain uh, 
certain threats because our government has given it has given part away part of the forest away to a sugar cane company and they want to take part of the forest for sugar cane growing and i think it is our responsibility as youth to come up and fight for this because we have most of our time left and therefore we have to fight for it and giving our part of this forest will set a bad precedent for future forest destruction and therefore we are coming out to stop this act in order to protect uh, other forests that are remaining so that we don't have to face this massive challenge again or these serious threats again and as much as everyone will be affected us the youth and children uh, will be affected most since we have the biggest burden on de deforestation and its effects so we came up with this global youth-led campaign to help us create awareness globally and also in our country by engaging communities corporate organizations and each and every person that could help in order to uh, fight. We are actually fighting back our government and we are demanding that it, it, it cancels a certificate that was issued to one of the sugarcane companies, that is the Economic, Social and Impact Assessment Certificate in order to save this forest, this certificate has to be crossed out by a government agency that is called National Environmental Management Agency, which is behind issuing the certificate. So if this um, government agency comes up and uh, crosses out or revokes this certificate, we would have we would have made a very big step in saving it. And apart from that, threats are continuing and also about 10,000 uh, hectares have been cut from the forest. And each and every time they continue to cut more part of the forest. We try to create uh, some actions, uh, part of, the environmentalists went to visit the forest, which is in uh, Kibale district. But then even before they could see the forest or they could go into the forest, they were arrested by police on spot and they were detained for some good days, even when they had not done anything. And many people have been threatened uh, to be killed, to be, uh, to be locked down, to be, you know, a lot of things that are happening. And we are scared of our lives. We are scared of what could happen anytime from now. But then we continue to create awareness about this issue because it not only affect us, affects us, but it also affects the people that are coming after us and also the people that are in the country right now. And right now we are having online campaigns as much as we can and creating awareness online. We also talk to communities, especially those that are live around the forest about what they can do, but we do this uh, in isolation and also in under like, um, like not openly because if any person or if there's any spy who gets to know this, then uh, our lives are at risk. But we are trying as much as we can to do what we can. Yeah, it's not easy, but we keep pushing for this. And in there is any way that international organizations or people or movements can help us in creating awareness about this and also putting pressure on our governments to do something. Uh, we are more than welcome to work with you in any way possible. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And 
Um, Hilda, I have like a little follow up question. Um, so would it be like a good idea maybe to think also in Germany a Fridays for Future to make because well in Germany we have like our little struggles also with protecting our forest to make more solidarity action also to um, uh, for you in Uganda. So would be maybe this be a really concrete idea also for Fridays for Future in Germany? Or do you wish more support on this view? Yes, yes, we really need a lot of support uh, because what we are against is uh, is a for like government. It's like government agencies, and in all cases, they have power to decide, and they have a lot of power. So we need a lot of support. We need solidarity strikes. We need solidarity actions. If we can get, if we can do this very often, then it can really create a big step. At least we can like put pressure on this government agency to do something and eventually they would try to do something. And also we would want them to accept uh, what is going on because right now this government agency is not it is not telling the truth about the whole situation. They are saying that the forest is safe, but then the forest is not safe. And people are really aware that it's being cut, but they are trying to create ideas in people's mind that the forest is safe. And having solidarity strikes will really help us to put out the picture that um, this is what is really happening. And we need to do a lot more than uh, telling lies, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, we will stay in contact about that. And we'll do some action, I think. Um, and well, William, are there any other question now from the chat? No, no new questions. So only the last I already told you. Okay, so I have a um, really uh, huge other topic. Oh, Peter, me. do you want to add something? Yes, I just yes. wanted to add to what uh, my sister Hilda uh, said about land, about uh, deforestation in Africa. And um, it's just very short I want to make because um, we have to also understand that land grabbing is a major issue in Africa, um, which also have a very big effect on the discussions about uh, climate change, because um, 11 hectares, 11 million hectares of land is owned by Europe in Africa, 11 million hectares of land. And we have um, the Chinese also marching in now, the scramble for Africa. So what does that mean? Um, it's just like Hamburg vibed when the, um, this uh, um, uh, RWE claimed because it owned the piece of land so it could destroy the, the forest. This is the same thing that is happening in Africa. If Europe owns 11 million hectares of land, a piece of so, so large piece of land that is enough to feed 65 million hungry Africans, then the ownership, the principle of ownership come to play because then they are allowed to do whatever they want to do with that piece of land. Of course, the result being deforestation and uh, monoculture, you know. Uh, just some years ago, I think I, I was in a, I was delivering a lecture and uh, haven't seen all these horrific images from Niger data. And after the lectures, the lady came to me, she was very touched and she told me that she needed to do something in Africa. 
to change the situation. And she said she would like to set up a project to teach the Africans how to carry out ecological, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, um, how to how to till the soil in such a way that mm, you know sustainable agriculture. Let me put it that way. So I was like shocked. You use the word in German, Ökobau. The Muslim, the the Afrikaner, by bringing me Ökobau, we have to teach them how to do that. And I was shocked because um, I have a reason for saying this. I was shocked because the African traditional way of agriculture before the white Europeans came in, or even the economic and industrial processes was always based on the principle of finding, finding harmony between human and nature, the reproductive part of it. And if somebody coming to me to tell me he wants to come around to start to teach me or teach us how to do that instead of the other way around. So what I'm saying is that we also have to change the discussion because you people always expect us to, to learn from you. Whereas you know your system is out of, out, of, out of place now. You never talk about what you learn from us, what you should learn from us on how to keep this environment intact. All we are hearing are dictates from Europe, from America, what Africa and um, um, uh, the global uh, uh, South should do, must do. But what are you saying about what you learn from us? You can learn, you have a, we have a lot you can learn from. Are you actually learning from us? You are just not admitting it. So let us change this discussion. I'm getting a little bit fed up, I'm tired of it. Because it's a new generation. It's a new era. You perhaps have noticed it. We are becoming loud and louder and we'll become louder and louder because we have a feeling that people we are talking to are kind of deaf. They don't, they pay deaf ears to what we've been saying for more than 500 years. For more than 500 years, empires have been built, economies, wealth have been accumulated on the on um, true exploitation and the destruction of environment and nature in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in Pacific, and we are living good here, and we feel that we are the best. Whereas you, we are nothing without these people. We know the truth. Isn't, isn't it so annoying to even see a three-year-old kid in Germany owning an iPhone? Isn't it so annoying that a, a seven-year-old kid is even owning two iPhones? Whereas children in Congo have to die to make that possible? And we should keep quiet? We should be polite. Of course, we are always polite. Africans are polite. Okay. I, I just don't want to bring in too much into it, but I just want to let you know that Europe has been learning from Africa, from other civilizations, but they just don't want to accept it. If you accept that which you are learning from Africa, you will realize what you can learn more about how to keep the climate, our environment intact, if you only listen to us. But you wouldn't do because the system of survivor here is only based on the exploitation. It's just the business plan. The business plan of Europe and the West is only based on the exploitation of Africa and the global South. There is no exit. There is no exit plan. I just wanted to sweep in that. Uh, 
Okay, thank you for um, for your message, which I think is it's really, really important. And um, also my next question, it goes a little bit also in this direction. And it's a well, really huge topic. Um, and Tony, she also told us about the conference you had two weeks, two weeks ago, right? And so um, I think, well, this next question, question is maybe also a topic for like a whole uh, other um, panel discussion uh, because it's a huge, but yes, uh, like you said, um, um, it's like about the injustice of racism and colonial behavior, uh, which is still the foundation of our economic system and our society in the global north and even is in our movement. Um, and now I do not want you to ask a specific question. I, I would rather would like to invite everyone who wants to share a thoughts on that topic or who wants to say something and to have a discussion about it, um, if it's okay for you and if, where we can speak about that. No. Yeah. Do you want me to go or was it directed to me? Um, if you uh, want uh, to go first, yes, of course. If another want to go first, um, well, so I don't have like a special order. Do you want to go first and to talk about the conference you had two weeks ago, maybe to share some thoughts about it? Um, yeah, uh, Peter was actually also one of our um, panelists for the opening uh, opening uh, session. Um, yeah, I think uh, it was a, in so many ways, a very inspiring um, experience for a lot of people who participated and for the organizers, um, as I often shared, like at the beginning of the year when uh, we were in this meeting um, uh, where all these different climate groups came together to plan the year 2021. And the diversity in the room was really um, lacking. It was uh, maybe four or five people who would identify themselves as, as BIPOC. And whenever we spoke, whenever I said that uh, we need to do better, there would be a lot of hand waves. But um, at the point we felt no one was really doing anything solid to change that. And I think in many ways, the fact that it was just this January, February, and then we thought, okay, we're going to do something about it. And then we could really do it by end of this year. And the way, like the amount of people we could bring in together, the um, interest uh, that we could generate the panel discussions. Um, I think the first panel where Peter was there was like absolutely beautiful in a way we had this amazing uh, speakers, uh, Brodotti, Roy was there, Imaitwen was there, Evin uh, Obu, uh, I, I, I don't uh, know how to pronounce her second name right, but Evin uh, moderated the session. Um, what we take away from that was, I think for me, um, also as one of the, the core orga, but also as a, individually, I think when we really try to do something from a place of conviction and we hold everyone to a higher standard, we really could um, bring about a change. And I think it's absolutely important to never um, give up on that. And especially the, the one, one thing um, what's different within the climate movement when we started the criticism was the movement has to do better. Because one thing I always said, like when we say we want to change the society, we have to do better than the rest of the society, you know? And uh, because the movement is aware and is trying to like change, like save us from a crisis, then of course, then it needs to do a lot of self-work. And this is a part of that self-work. And I think really from 2018 till 2020, in these two years, in my experience, a lot has changed. Um, there is way more awareness and there is really a lot of interest to really work and address on this theme. And I think as a result of that, as I said, also in, as a part, like as a result of that, we see this, this panel is being organized. We see more and more collaboration. We see 
now we are launching the ecocide campaign so i think this is, is a, it's a continuation of all of this discussion and this this momentum that we've been trying to create and i think that gives me a lot of hope and power to, to go on and gives a lot of strength like knowing that yeah this is this is this kind of all this small transformation creates a ground for a bigger transformation and i think in this way we are on the right path and i would just quickly pick up um, uh, this question that uh, Miriam was sharing, like, how do we stay? So I would just take on that to, to close my um, this statement that how do we stay positive regarding the like we have been mobilizing for so long, we still don't see solid changes, and how do we still keep um, staying hopeful? How do we stay hopeful? And I think it's important to celebrate all the small wins that we get, all the small um, because. It's always uh, like the small wins creates a foundation for bigger changes. And I think we have a lot of small wins that we need to acknowledge and celebrate. And at the same time, uh, to know that we do not really, what, what, what is the other alternative? Like we cannot give up. We can only hold each other and ourselves um, to a higher standard. And at the same time, we create so much beautiful thing when we keep organizing and mobilizing and um yeah being open to each other's criticism as well as um each other's feedback and love so i think that gives me a lot of strength so i think yeah that's what i would say <laughs> to finish thank you so much um to our other guests do you also want to add Only if you like. Let me add one small uh, thing, if you allow me to do. And I think we should stop rewarding criminals, environmental criminals. And I want to support my case with a historical fact. The abolition of slavery by the British Parliament only came into effect after compensating the criminals who enslaved my forefathers. So, and history is also, I mean, the, the history, has, this process has, has, is continuing from, has always continued from that day to today that criminals are always, uh, instead of being punished, they are rewarded. Shell, Chevron, Siemens, um, Bayer, Monsanto, Coca-Cola, all the big uh, agricultural firms in Europe, all of them are heavily supported uh, sub, uh, they, they get heavy subsidy from their respective governments to come to my country, to come to Africa and other parts of the world to commit ec uh, economic and environmental crimes and go unpunished. They get even rewarded for that. Not only that, these people in these rich countries, because Germany is a poor country, I always say that, people always say, what are you talking about? Germany is a poor country. It's only a little bit funny and that a, a poor country becomes one of the richest country in the world. Something, it doesn't fit. So, and so we, we, need, to, we need to talk about that. So this is, this, I hope this will be my conclusive statement that we should take this very seriously to criminalize the act of destruction of our environment, of our nature, of the biodiversity, because that is our future. And the, if we think that we are in comfort zones here in Europe, because we have all our social securities, of course, social security based on the exploitation of other people from other parts of the world. Let me just remind you that for uh, 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 the, 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 the Holland and 
Scandin I think it's Sweden or Finland or one of those countries even directly have their social funds financed through profits made by oil companies like Shell. So invariably or practically, we from this part of the world, we are financing your own systems, not even indirectly. So what we're saying now is that we have to turn the table because the table is turning in the other part of the world. And you cannot sit back to think that you are, in, you are living in a comfort zone. You see the, uh, the influx of uh, refugees all over the world. And let me remind everyone here that war or political persecution is not the major cause of migration or, 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 or making people to flee their homes, but it is the destruction of the environment and thereby the destruction of the livelihood of these people that, are, that is actually forcing people to migrate, to take all this risk. And all these people come here and what do we call them? We call them economic refugees. This is so, this is so crazy. This is so annoying. This is so, so, so unfair. You even, call, you even have the God to call people economic refugees without even mentioning the economic criminals, the environmental criminals. You don't even mention them. When there is war in Syria, you will say Sadar is the cause of this war. But why don't you mention the names of those people destroying the environment, making life difficult for the people in this part of the world? And I tell you, the vast majority of uh, vast majority of the refugees worldwide are on the road because their life means of livelihood or the social security have been threatened. And climate change is not didn't just come from heaven. It, it, it was caused by, by man and woman. And we know, we Africans, we know we only contribute a meager part to this global problem. We know that. But we are feeling the, the pain most. This is the injustice that has to stop. Not true only words or whatever. If you want to make a change, make a change there. And you will see that people will start to have that feeling of justice. That's my conclusion. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your words. And um, so uh, because we only have like 10 minutes left, I also would like to, to invite um, Mariner and then Hilda to, um, well, to, to maybe to also have your last words. Um, I, and also like my last question was also a little bit like which project are you working on right now? And how could, um, could we like support it from Germany, if there is like a possibility. And also there was one question from the chat, which was uh, pretty beautiful. Um, Miriam, do you want to read it again? Um, of course. It was the question, how do you keep up hope and motivation in the fight against climate change and for climate justice, despite so many frustrations and seeing no fundamental change happening? Mary, Mary, do you want to start? And then Hilda, I have the last word. Yeah, um, so we, for the first question, we have actually a lot that is going on now um, in the Philippines, but we would really appreciate if you would also sign the petition for the climate justice liability petition. We already had a result last COP25 in Madrid and 
it has already been like it is already legally this corporation could be legally um liable they're legally accountable however we have to put pressure to the commission on human rights in the philippines to release the resolution of what could be the next step so that could be our um maybe you could help us with that amplifying the voices and also for the second question from the chat box i think what keeps me moving is you know the picture of how my community has been devastated the picture of how my house has been washed out the picture of how my family and community have struggled to find a shelter a temporary shelter and food to eat we were isolated for how many days and there were no help at, 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 at those time whenever i feel like uh, there is no change that is happening i always ask myself like is this even worth fighting for still am i really am i even making a difference am i even um effective in what i'm doing i have always been i always go back to my biggest why why i even started this this fight i why i even decided that i should focus on this advocacy because this advocacy is very personal to me this is very this, for me if you say like climate change is not real you're saying like these people my relatives my friends have died just because of of something that is you know and and denying climate change feels like unfair to me because I have lost so much and then you're just denying that it, it doesn't exist. Well, it exists in us and we have been experiencing the brand of it. And we are hopeful because we don't have a choice, but be hopeful because if you will see the report, the IPCC reports, everything, the graphics and everything, you will, it, it is so hard to even cling to us to a small hope that there could be a change but we're still but young people now are gathered young people now are doing our best so they so that we could save our future i don't want that my future or my children's future could just be surviving typhoons i don't want their future could just be surviving every other disaster i want them to reach their dreams i want them to study to 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 be educated to do whatever they want and they will not have that if they will be busy surviving super typhoons or other disasters and the 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 decision the action should be made now not in 10 year 10 years or five years it should be made now and i always say this whenever um, i talk to people that do not be afraid of raising your voice. Do not be afraid of starting something, you know. I know all of you here have already started something on your own way. And you should not feel like you are just alone doing something because collectively we can do so much with our individual actions. And you should never ever discourage yourself that um, you are not doing anything or you are not uh, um, amplifying something because a single action can be multiplicate can be multiplied and it has a big effect not just in your country but also in other countries from other parts of the world thank you so much Kira, you have the, the last word uh, thank you so much well i will start by uh, adding on what Marinelle has just said, that uh, you can take an action. It doesn't matter if you are the only person doing it. Uh, for example, I take on a lecture cleanup activity. I clean up lectures of Lake Victoria and I started alone. And right now I get people to join me from different parts of the communities and also from different parts of the country. So you start small and everything will work out. People will get to know about what you do and they will always come and support you. And I wanted to conclude with a statement that um, we should always we should we should always not wait for pandemics and disasters to break out for us to act. We should always take on the lead. Uh, this 
um, COVID pandemic has shown us that climate action is actually uh, necessary, like it can be done, but the big question is why haven't we done anything about it already? Because if we can take such massive steps for uh, a COVID pandemic, then why not for climate change, which is even a more global challenge than COVID is. And about the question that was asked, how that was asked about how we keep on doing what we are doing despite our inaction or no response is, in my perspective as a victim of this climate crisis, I would say that climate injustice or this climate crisis left me no choice. Because when we keep experiencing these effects over and over again, every time there's something new, every time there's something coming up this way, that way, you find yourself um, in this bubble that there's no way you can get out. You find yourself tied to it. And the best you can do is to act, is to raise your voice, is to do this action, do this action, go for this, go for this. So we are stuck in this bubble it's the only thing we can do right now in order to have uh to have a say or to have a secure future and we are not even sure if it will be a secure future or we or if we even have any future in that case but we are left with no choice apart from fighting for this and also acting engaging other people doing communal activities because for now that is what we can do and we will keep doing this for as long as it takes and it's our hope that our voices are heard listened to and also acted upon yeah thank you oh, thank you uh, all so much for participating on this panel. It was an honor to have you all here together and to have like a discussion together and to bring you together also. Um, I learned a lot from you and I would love to stay in touch. I think we will do all to stay in touch for further action. And um, well, another word is possible is also just a slogan, but I really believe deeply in it and um well i will continue to fight for it with you guys together and i think that miriam also wants to say some last words yes i just want to thank you so much for being here tonight for speaking to us to the people here who are interested and it moved me and i'm sure that the other peoples out there are moved to and i i will back them or i will ask them to take their time now to think about it for 10 minutes or something because we want to do like a self-care awareness part afterwards. It's just so that you know what I will talk in German to them afterwards. So a big thank you from the organization, from our public climate school team. We are really, really happy to have you here. And so I also thank the people who stayed with us tonight. And yeah, it was such a great evening. And now I, I continue in German and vielen Dank an euch da draußen, dass ihr so lange durchgehalten habt. Um, wir hatten auf dem Stundenplan steht für jetzt, steht Self-Care, Awareness. Und wir haben uns gedacht, wir fordern euch dazu auf oder motivieren euch. Nehmt euch jetzt ein paar Minuten, nehmt euch Zeit, überlegt, denkt nach über das, was ihr gehört habt. Wir haben heute Abend gehört, Emotionen sind das Erste, die uns vielleicht bewegen, mehr Menschen zu motivieren und weiter unseren Zielen hinterherzustreben und weiter diese Welt, naja, zu retten, würde ich sagen. Und deshalb schließt vielleicht die Augen, denkt nach und redet morgen mit Menschen darüber, was ihr gehört habt. Wieder die Erinnerung, wenn ihr, wenn ihr Support braucht, wenn ihr Menschen, mit denen ihr kommunizieren wollt, nicht in eurem Umfeld findet, dann wendet euch an unsere Awareness-Seite. Wir sind da für euch und jetzt bleibt mir eigentlich nur zu sagen, danke, dass ihr hier wart. Das Programm morgen ist genauso super wie heute, also schaltet nochmal ein. Die Highlights findet ihr auf unserer Website 
und auf Instagram. Und genau. So, thank you again. We are just waving now to say goodbye and so that the Technic team knows that we can go offline. So, goodbye, good night, and I hope to see you again.